Well, joining me now to discuss why mankind is failing the rhino is Adam Veltz, Wild Aid South Africa representative, a group that aims to stop poaching. Thanks a lot for joining us, Adam. African rhinos could be extinct in 10 years or within 10 years, according to experts. That's a startling forecast. Why and where have we failed the rhino? Well, I think we've failed to communicate successfully with uh, buyers of horn in Asia. We failed to communicate the message that a rhino horn doesn't cure any disease. It's not a particularly durable store of wealth. And we failed to communicate just how uh, delicate the situation is in terms of, of their very survival of, of our five rhino species in the world. I think uh, people, once they understand how, uh, how their consuming habits, their habits of buying rhino horn actually affect rhinos, I think it causes a lot of them to, to, to rethink that. But unfortunately, we're in uh, the grip of some very sophisticated criminal criminal syndicates who are extremely good at marketing their products to people. So people in Asia with money are being told lies, plain and simple. Uh, for example, that rhino horn can cure cancer, which, uh, for which there is absolutely no medical evidence. They're being told that a rhino horn is a health tonic, that it will promise them long life. They've been told that, as I say, rhino horn is almost like a gold bar. It's extremely valuable. It's a, it's a store of value. It can be used to bribe officials in order to get government contracts and things like this. And, and uh, a lot of people in Asia who have no primary experience with rhinos in Africa, have no real knowledge of rhinos, believe this. Um, and, uh, you know, as I say, I think that's our core failure at this point, is really communicating the truth about rhino horn and, and what's actually happening here in Africa, which is, is, it's not a good situation that we're facing at the moment. What about those who might say to you to save the rhino from extinction let's legalize and regulate the trade yeah well there's several things i can say to people who want to legalize the trade in rhino horn um, as you might know uh, and your viewers might know the international trade in rhino horn is currently illegal it's also illegal in uh, most of the countries in asia where people are buying it it's also illegal to buy and sell largely in africa so um the first thing I'd have to say to these people that want to legalize the trade in rhino horn is you've got a huge job ahead of you changing enormous numbers of uh, laws around the world in order to enable your trade, uh, changing the international uh, community's attitudes towards trade. The international community is extremely negative towards trade at the moment because of past experience. Back in the 1960s, 1970s, when trade was legal, we saw enormous numbers of rhinos being killed for horn. Um, and I would also say to them that, you know, you shouldn't be promoting a useless product <laughs> uh, to desperate people. As I say, I think uh, there's a moral aspect to this. A lot of people in Asia buy rhino horn because they believe it's going to cure serious disease like cancer, and they spend enormous amounts of money on it. And I think, quite frankly, that's immoral. Um, I also think a very important point that we need to make is as soon as we legalize rhino horn. We're inviting people to promote its use. We're, provide, uh, we're inviting the people who sell rhino horn to advertise it and s further spread these myths about it. And I think that is deeply harmful. And we run the risk of therefore creating runaway demand in Asia, where Asian people, uh, enormous numbers, more Asian people than are buying it right now, um, are interested in buying it. And the legal trade is not, it's simply not big enough there are simply not enough rhinos to supply that trade and uh, uh, in a situation of runaway demand and uh, we will see a massive increase in poaching yeah. um, uh, resulting from that. I mean you believe there's a fallacy behind the demand it still exists whether we like it or not right in the short term if you fail to sort of solve the supply demand issues in the short term do you think that maybe for example the South African government needs to do more 826 rhinos were poached at the Kruger National Park in 2015. Uh, in the short term, do you think there needs to be sort of more rangers, more drones for surveillance, more security, more people just, you know, 
physically, in a security sense, stopping the poachers? Let me just address this question of demand very briefly. I think sure. there's a misconception about demand. People think that the current demand for rhino horn is driven by history. You know, they point out the fact that uh, Chinese traditional medicine practitioners have used rhino horn for thousands of years. That's true. They used rhino horn as a fever reducer. What we're seeing right now is that criminal networks are promoting the use of rhino horn for non-traditional uses. And what the demand that's driving the poaching now is completely novel. It's a very new thing. The Chinese traditional medicine community, in fact, turned their backs on rhino horn more than 20 years ago. In 1993, rhino horn was removed from the official pharmacopoeia of the Chinese traditional medicine community in China. Getting back to what we should be doing here in South Africa, I think we should be applying the law uh, more strongly towards higher ups in these criminal syndicates. You know, at the moment there is a, essentially a, a low level uh, hot war going on in the Kruger Park. We have uh, the, the authorities there tell me they have live fire firefights three times a week on average. Some nights they have 20 groups of poachers coming into the park, all heavily armed. Uh, just last week a poacher was killed in a shootout uh, with rangers and every year we see tens of poachers being killed in shootouts with rangers. There is a very difficult situation there but killing these low-level guys in the syndicates is not solving the problem. We need to aggressively go after the higher-ups in these syndicates and we haven't seen nearly enough of that happening here. We haven't seen nearly enough collaboration between African, Middle Eastern and Asian governments in order to expose these syndicates and uh, that I think is a problem. You know we run a real risk of of alienating communities around our national parks by killing too many poachers. Uh, it's not a solution to the problem. Whenever you kill a poacher you're killing somebody's brother, you're killing somebody's father, you're killing somebody's uncle, you're killing a provider and you run a risk of turning that community against the national park. Right. What our national parks need to be doing is building better relationships with these communities. Okay, Adam, it's been great talking to you. Very informative. Thank you very much for joining us, Adam Vells.